sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam, the Australian National Imams Council came out with a report recently discussing the controlled atmospheric stunning of poultry. This, this report was released uh, just last week and uh, naturally there's a lot of questions that have come from the community. We've organized this uh, podcast live event for everyone inshallah to listen to the clarifications and the answers of all of your questions that have come through. Inshallah, we're going to be joined with the medical experts who have been involved with the report itself, alongside esteemed guests, Inshallah. My name is Imam Ibrahim. I'm an ANIC Executive Committee member. I'm also joined with Imam Shadi Suleiman, the President of the Australian National Imams Council. I'm also joined with Brother Naji, who's also the ANIC Halal Manager. I'm also joined with medical experts, Dr. Walid and Dr. Ihab, both of whom are experts in their own right. One is an anesthetist and the other is a cardiologist, respectively. Brothers and sisters in Islam, there's a lot to discuss, insha'Allah. We're going to get through things one by one and bi ta'ala explain all of your questions. First of all, I'd like to turn my attention to Sheikh Shadi. Zakallah khairan, Sheikh. Uh, inshallah, I'll let you to explain to everyone how we got here and what was the background behind all of this story. Jazakallah khair, uh, Imam Ibrahim, and uh, to our panelists, uh, Brother Naji, uh, Dr. Yahab, and uh, Dr. Walid, and to our viewers, Jazakumullah khairan, and uh, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this gathering a blessed gathering. Yes, as you mentioned, there are a lot of questions out there with some confusion. And unfortunately, some grief and inconvenience. And um, the Australian National Imams Council did come out with this statement after two years of exploring this. So it didn't come out of nowhere and it wasn't rushed. Now, after the One Path documentary that came out two years ago, the ANIC has absolutely nothing to do with it. And uh, uh, obviously, the exposure that One Path had, a lot of people start to ask questions and a lot of people didn't even know of the CAS or the GAS stunning now we as the australian national imams council for the last few years we've been looking into it but obviously after the documentary and the exposure of that documentary on a large number of viewers people start to ask the question and obviously people start to resort back to anic they wanted answers and uh, obviously this is not something new it's a global issue it's not something in australia so the cas which is the controlled atmosphere <laughs> stunning let's call it the gas stunning it's something that's been around for decades, but it's been more prominent in the last 10 years. Prior to that, it used to be the water bath stunning, and prior to that, there was no stunning. And uh, we, as the Australian National Imams Council, a group of over 250 imams who look into the Sharia matters, who are, who are experts in Sharia, when this matter came to our attention and uh, a lot of people asking the questions, we could have relied on a global report. There are a lot of reports by you know global standards, by government agencies, Malaysia, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Egypt, even in Turkey, and they all have their own reports based on the gas stunning, and they've all said that it does kill the animal. And that's why globally, no global halal agency and government agency accepts gas stunning. Some of them don't even accept the water bath stunning, you know, but, you know, globally, it's a standard. So we could have just relied on those reports and said, you know what, we'll just go with the global standard and say it's a haram. But we said, let's engage with our own experts, let's go through the process, and let's uh, go and report. So we engaged with the Mashaikh. At that moment, we met with a few people in the industry, and they've all confirmed. These are people mm -hmm. in the slaughterhouses, these are people in the industry, and they all confirmed that the birds that come out of the gas chamber, the, out of the gas chamber are dead. But these are, this is what they said. And uh, it's known in the industry, like, you know, there's no two ways about it, that... Uh, the birds that come out of the gas chamber, they are non-reversible. So in the past, you know, before we, we went into the details of the technology and the reports and the, you know, the profound reports, especially the one that Andy recently, you know, issued. In the past, what they used to do is that when they used to go through the, the stunning, especially the water bath stunning, they take off the shackles, they put it on the ground, wait a minute or two, and then comes back alive. Alhamdulillah, there's a, that's a clear sign, a sign that it's uh, alive. But when it comes to the gas tunning, it's impossible for it to come back alive. And this no, there's no dispute amongst the people in this industry that if a bird goes through the gas chamber, it's going to come back alive. It's irreversible. 
But you know, we could have also relied on that. That's another way of knowing things. But we wanted to go to the detailed, profound, you know, uh, to the bottom of this. So we went and engaged with the experts. Now, who determines if the bird is alive or dead? Not me as an imam. That's not my expertise. Not the mashaykh, not the fatwa council. The expert. You've got the experts in this area. So we went to the vet <coughs> and we engaged with T1 vet company. It's a costly process, but we're willing to invest one because community has the rights. So I went to a T1 vet company who that, that we engage with and, and when we sat down with them, we told them, give us everything. Because, you know, you need to identify the scope, which Brother Nigel can uh, elaborate on uh, later on. So we told them, we want, you to we want you to investigate and give us a report on every single part to know, just to the lowest and, and the, 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 the maximum of uh, that report. So they said that's the ECG, and I remember at that time they even struggled to get a machine because you know a machine for the bird ECG. Like it's a very technical thing. That's not my job as uh, an imam or the mashaykh. So we resorted and we did the right thing. We went to the, we engaged with the experts and we told them to uh, investigate this. Then we had the challenge of having access to a plant, you know, having access to a poultry plant where they use the gas tunning. Now, because we don't have any, you know, we have the Anik Halal certification body, we only do and uh, only, uh, you know, uh, certify plants with uh, water bath stunning. We don't have any plant that we have this relationship with them that would allow us to uh, have access to the uh, factory or to their poetry that use gas. So through contacts here and there, one of the big facilities, you know, one of the big facilities in the country, it's not like a small facility. We're talking about one of the big facilities and to their credit, they were very uh, accommodating. But we didn't. We just didn't agree at the end, you know. So we agreed with that facility, and we, you know, it was, it's not even New South Wales. They travelled to that big facility with few people from Anik, few people from uh, the imams there, and those experts themselves. And they had two experts and the vet of the of the facility itself, and they did, you know, the the testing on twenty nine birds. We asked the question: Is twenty nine enough? They said in the industry that's more than enough, because people are asking that question, you know. At the end of the day, we went back to the experts, not me as an imam that. We decided what we think is the standard. The experts are the ones who decide the standard. And then they went through the report. And Wallah, I'll be honest with you. I was from the bottom of my heart saying, Ya Allah, you know, make it easy on us. Because I do understand that if the report comes back, in which we were expecting that the report comes back that we're dead, I do understand that this is going to cause a huge inconvenience and grief in the community. And I even start to play in my mind. What about, how about if this report comes back and says they're alive? I still have another issue I need to deal with. That report is going to be in, in challenging the global reports. That's not an easy thing for us also to be in. But anyway, we waited for the report to come back. It came back, a full study from the experts who have nothing to do with us or them. They just did their job. They gave it to us and they gave us their personal opinion. You know, And their opinion was that these animals were or these birds were dead, including ECG reports that w they told us that's not expertise. Go and find uh, someone who's a cardiologist that will, you know, translate this to you. So I went to Dr. Ihab is with us, who's an expert in this area. He's a cardiologist himself. And he went through the report with his professional opinion. He said, to me, in my industry, this is a dead animal. So obviously, this is one report that we've got right in front of us. So what we did, we called for an ANIC executive committee meeting and a fatwa council meeting. This report, people know that we've been very transparent. It was in March 2022, so 14 months ago. We called for an ANIC Executive Committee meeting and we called for a Fatwa Council meeting. And we invited to that meeting Brother Naji, who was part of the process, and we invited Dr. Ihab. And the Fatwa Council imams uh, were listening to the presentation of both Brother Naji and Dr. Ihab. And at the end of the day, again, these are imams, these are ulama, these are scholars. They're not the expertise to determine if the bird is alive or dead, you know. So the question was, so according to your expertise, according to your professional opinion, are these birds alive or dead? So the answer came back said, they were dead. So the Fatwa Council turned around and said, well, you have two options. If it's dead, there's no two ways about it. Dead, it means dead, it's haram, it's made up. Or get us another report that says they're alive and we'll explore that. Get us another report. This is May last year. So that's 12 months ago. We know that this report is going to cause a huge grief in the community. So we didn't want to rush and, uh, and produce this report to the community, even though a lot of people are upset. Like you've, been, you've had this report 14 months and yet you haven't even told us anything about it. But we needed to go through the process and do our due diligence. 
So I want to, we start to explore many other options, including trying to do other tests or other plants. Now, is one report from one pla plant with this industry or in this industry with this standard enough? From my understanding, it is enough. But we want to get into different plants, two and three and four. The issue is that these plants don't give you access because either they don't need you or they already have a halal certification from a different body. They told you, why should you even come in and ruin my business? So we tried in many different ways to access other plans and for the last 14 months we did not get any access. And we're going to continue though. So we haven't, we're going to continue and inshallah we're going to exert all the efforts for us to try and get access to those plans and do other testing. But also what supports our report, that our report is in line with the global standard report. So it's not like we are the only people who produced a report on Kastani. You're talking about governments, Muslim and the Islamic agencies around the world, in particular Indonesia and Malaysia and UAE and uh, Saudi Arabia, they have their own reports and these are governments that have access to many different plans. They've got their reports and their reports are exactly as our reports. So we didn't come up with something new. If we came up with something new saying that, that the birds that go through the gas tunning are alive, that would have been a big issue. How you challenge these reports? You've got one report against you know, tens of other reports, global reports from all around the world. And including not only the Muslim countries, even non-Muslim countries. In the Western countries, where Muslim halal certification bodies, or Muslim bodies had already uh, did their own reports. And their reports are also in line with our report. But we tried to, you know, have access to other plants. Unfortunately, we tried, we tried that nothing, in, unfortunately, we didn't get the chance to uh, access those plants. But alhamdulillah, we already have our own report. Then what we did is that we engaged with the rest of the imams. We called for a national meeting of the 250 imams last November. That's six months ago. I wanted to put them in the picture. These are the reports. These are the experts' opinion. And this is the outcome. Now, obviously, you already have some imams who have background knowledge on this. They're already determined on it. You've got imams. That's the first time they hear of it, like many of our community members and viewers tonight. And you had imams who said, no, nah, I've heard this. And someone told me this. And I've experienced that. So our response is to all the imams, please come back with an expert's report that challenges this report so we could review it. So we called upon all the Imams, if you have a report that challenges the current report that we've got, which is also in line with the global, we are still open to looking into that report. So November, December, January, February, March, April, May, till this day, not even one report. Not even one report. So you've got all these reports, including our uncommissioned report, that say that the birds that go through the gas chamber are dead and we can't even get one report that says it's alive we got one report from one entity which is incomplete not allowed this it, we just couldn't even read it just a few extra photos so but generally we could even get a proper report that we can read we'll look into to say otherwise and unfortunately after 14 months having this report and going back and forth with the imams the only reason that we've <laughs> delayed is we tried to explore other options and the Fatwa Council members, the ANIC Executive Committee, we're very concerned about the confusion or the concerns or even the grief that this is going to cause. But unfortunately, we had no other choice except to issue this statement. I know that a lot of people in our community are grieved. I know a lot of people in our community are in a position of inconvenience. I understand that. We are part of the community. But I'm sure the community wouldn't like it to know that we've had this report 40 months. Or we've been sitting on it trying to explore other options. And I don't know. I don't have all the solutions. I have part of the solution, but the, a lot more needs to be done. By the time I get you at least 50% of the solution, probably could take six months to one year. People are not going to be happy to know that I've had a report for two years, sitting on this report and trying all this, and we haven't even told the community about it. So yes, I'm so sorry to hear that the community is in convenience and grief, and we share that grief, but this is the situation that we're in right now. And we still call upon anyone that can produce an expert's reputable report that can counter our report and counter the global reports, the Imams are still open to discuss it. And that's why our statement is very open. We've engaged with the experts. That's the expert's opinion. It's in line with the global reports and the you know, tens of reports out there which are conducted by far bigger organizations and entities than any. But we are still open if there's a professional expert's report that comes forward that challenges the current report that we've got. We're happy to look into it. We're happy to debate it. We're happy to explore it. We're happy to look into discussing it and uh, try and find alternatives. So this is where we are. And it's a very unfortunate situation. But Alhamdulillah, we are a resilient community. 
So, you know, we've had bigger challenges in the past than the challenge of eating poetry. And I'm sure, inshallah, we'll overcome this. Zakla khairan, Sheikh, for the, um, for, the, for the background information on this. Just to our viewers, inshallah, um, let's uh, take a step into the textual evidences in regards to why such a, a bird would be considered haram to consume. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it impermissible for Muslims to eat anything that's considered mayta. He says in the Quran, يَا أَيُّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَيْتَ So, O oh, you who believe, it is impermissible for you to eat what is considered carrion, which is, an, uh, which is a dead animal. Now, this animal, uh, which dies before slaughter, is now considered carrion, and therefore, Islamically speaking, it cannot be consumed. It's also dying because of uh, strangulation or suffocation, which is also mentioned later on in the ayah as munkhaniqa, which is the, uh, the strangled uh, animal. Now, there's uh, much to discuss, inshallah. I'm going to move on to the medical experts. Uh, first of all, I'd like to get started with, inshallah, Dr. Uh, Ihab, who was involved in this process. Now, the scope for this study, which we're going to be speaking about a bit later on, was determined by the experts. The most important part in regards to this scope was the vital signs that were present within the birds that came out after studying. The Australian standards that are set by the Department of Agriculture states that if there's any absence of three or more uh, vital signs, then the animal is considered dead. This report uh, highlights that there are more than three, the absence of three uh, uh, vital signs uh, within, these within this poultry that's, after, that's, that's gone through this, this uh, stunning process. Uh, to add to this, uh, the experts also mentioned, let's get an ECG reading. The ECG reading uh, consists of the electrical pulses that are measured uh, around the heart to see if there is any heart activity within these birds. The ECG readings were taken by the experts. However, uh, to state whether this electrical activity is uh, indeed, in fact, uh, mentioning death or life, the uh, veterinarians uh, uh, said that it is not their uh, expertise. And so they said, do consult a uh, cardiologist on the matter. So we reached out to an expert in the field, Dr. Ihab, who is a cardiologist, and he himself got involved uh, uh, in this process. So Dr. Ihab, Jazakallah khairan for joining us today. Welcome, Sheikh Ibrahim. Uh, many thanks for the lovely introduction and uh, Sheikh Shadi for uh, the, the great overview. You have now walk us through, inshallah. Is vital signs enough to determine whether an animal is alive or, or, or dead? So, yeah, the so vital signs by, by its name is, is, uh, is what we actually use to determine whether a, a human or uh, an animal is alive or dead. Um, for any uh, being, human or animal, to be alive, you need a beating heart. Um, so, you need evidence that the heart is beating. You need um, breathing activity um, to um, be able to circulate oxygenated blood to the, the rest of the organs. Um, and you need evidence of those things. Sometimes you need brain activity, but uh, sometimes you don't. It can get a little bit technical here on brain death and whatnot, which is beyond the scope of, of, uh, of this discussion. But essentially, for a being to be alive, you need heartbeat and you need breathing activity. And you need to be, to be able to, to detect that. Uh, so, typically, for a, a human, uh, obviously I'm not a vet, but um, uh, for a human or um, a, an animal to um, to show any signs of life, we need to detect those things. So, um, as per the report, um, the the vets that conducted this report looked at these vital signs, um, namely cardiac activity. So that's the activity of the heart, as evidenced by um, listening to the heart sounds, which was called auscultation. Uh, feeling for the pulse, which is called palpation, uh, inspection for uh, breathing movements uh, of the bird um, to check for any breathing activity. They also looked at a number of other signs that might indicate brain activity, like uh, muscle movements, uh, flapping of the wings, and um, um, what's called palpebral reflex, which is uh, touching the inside of the eye and, and checking uh, for any uh, uh, response to that. Um, so, so vital signs are quite important in determining uh, whether someone is alive or dead, and that's what we use uh, to to certify death, uh, essentially uh, in humans, largely for me, and obviously in animals. 
Dr. Ihab, you saw you saw the results of the ECG uh, that were pre that were uh, presented to you. Now, walk us through what you saw and uh, how you determined uh, uh, the results of all of these ECG readings. Yeah. So, so an ECG is an abbreviation for something called electrocardiogram, uh, and and what that means is essentially. Um, you get a representation of the electrical activity of the heart by placing a number of leads on the uh, chest and the limbs of the you, you know uh, uh, animal or we'll just talk about animals here uh, because that's that's what we're talking about so the of the bird um, and that represents the electrical activity of the heart um, now uh, normally you'd have some organized electrical activity and um, you know in in without referring to the specifics of the report there was one um, uh, ECG in all of the 30 ECGs that were presented, which showed any sign of electrical activity, uh, organized electrical activity of the heart, which is that of the control bird, which was not gas stunned. The other 29 birds that, um, that uh, were examined um, showed no organized electrical activity of the heart. Um, some of them, and um, the report is public and I'm sure people have seen it, some of them show just a, a flat line on the surface ECG, which is kind of easy to understand from the movies and so on. And this flat line means that nothing is going on and, and that animal is dead. Others showed a bit of um, uh, just a, a bit of an uh, you know, irregular sort of line that is uh, not consistent with anything. That, we call that uh, motion artifact. Um, motion artifact results from poor placement of the leads on the... Um, uh, on the surface of the of the animal or the bird, it happens even in humans when you have uh, you know someone with a hairy chest, for instance, and the the lead doesn't stick very well to to the hair on the chest, and and then you get a lot of artifact. That's why people get shaved uh, when they uh, when they have the ECG done um, uh, to to have good contact of the leads with a bird with feathers and and movement and and so on and so forth it's very uh, uh, possible uh, slash likely that there was very poor contact of these uh, ECG leads on the surface of the bird. Um, a couple of the ECGs shows um, a very irregular electrical activity um, that could represent something uh, called ventricular fibrillation. Very difficult to tell from the ECGs that were presented. Uh, ventricular fibrillation is a condition where um, the heart is fibrillating is which is what the word means which is instead of contracting nice and regular it's fibrillating it's just it's just twitching um, that is a, a pre-death state uh, in general for the heart the heart can twitch a little bit before um, the the animal is dead um, and that does not lead to an effective uh, uh, pumping or contraction of the heart and does not lead to effective circulation and not compatible with life um, so uh, I'm uh, a cardiologist, but my subspecialty training is actually something called cardiac electrophysiology. So uh, my subspecialty is that electrical activity as well. So when people struggle with an ECG or even other medical professionals, they would ask me for opinion. Uh, so based on my experience and my reading of this, uh, of the ECGs attached to this report, none of the 29 animals after the, uh, sorry, birds, after the gas uh, stunning, showed any signs of organized electrical activity of the heart on the ECG. Uh, for explaining that uh, to us. So uh, at the end of the day, you've completed your assessment. Now, what's your thoughts on the actual report and uh, of, of the Australian National Mounds Council coming out with this uh, such report? I was actually quite impressed, to be honest, when I was first presented with that report last year for the initial discussions, because um, I mean, there is a general, um, I don't know, uh, feel that, uh, the, you know, the, the things are not being done scientifically. And I was quite impressed by uh, but how, how uh, scientific and how um, uh, appropriately the report was done. So uh, reading the report, it was done by two vets. Um, the methodology of um, examining the birds is stipulated quite clearly. Um, and um, the two vets agreed on the results. Um, which uh, adds the strength of the uh, of the results. Um, they were quite clear in stipulating exactly what they're looking for. Um, they had the results uh, outlined uh, very clearly. So for an experimental report of that nature, I think the report was very well done. Um, the question was clear and the question is simple. Um, are the birds uh, alive or dead 
after gas stunning, and they took all the measures to be able to answer that question. They reported it uh, very well. Um, I obviously disagreed with their interpretation of the ECG, uh, but because that's sort of my area of expertise. But um, I think, uh, you know, with that exception, I think they have they have done really well. Um, and uh, you know, based on my overall reading of the report, I obviously haven't been there for the experiment myself, uh, but just by reading the report. Um, uh, I can say that none of the 29 animals uh, were alive um, after gas stunning. So you have, um, you said that you you disagreed with the um, the results that were presented. So what what do you mean by that? I mean, what was the disagreement here? So what was what was presented in the original report was that there were signs of electrical activity in 24 out of the 29 birds examined after gas stunning. Uh, but when I looked at the actual ECGs, uh, it was showing what we've just discussed, which is that motion artifact, which is not really organized electrical activity. Um, I mean, in the report, it's actually clear on the control bird that you can see that electrical activity. So there's something called the P wave followed by QRS complex, which represents the um, atrium and the ventricle depolarizing and repolarizing regularly in the control bird. None of these waves are present in the, any of the 29 animals uh, ECGs. Um, I think as, a, as an, on another note, I think it's important for any scientific report or experiment that the conclusions are drawn based on the input that went into that experiment. So the authors were very clear in stipulating what were the gas stunning protocol that was used in this report. And the six stages of gas stunning were clearly stipulated. The size of the bird was clearly, uh, was clearly mentioned in the report. So I think what we can conclude is that if you put that side size bird into that protocol of gas stunning, then the bird will be dead after gas stunning. But if you change the protocol, if you change the size of the bird, if you change anything in, in that scientific formula, you might end up with a different result. So I think it's important to say that within the parameters that this report uh, was done in, uh, all the birds were dead after uh, um, uh, the gas stunning. Indeed, there are there are some variables that may change within the the uh, the, the testing. Jazakallah uh, khairan, doctor, you have for your time and uh, your expertise uh, in explaining the ECG results to all of our viewers. Now, I just like to um, invite, inshallah, our next uh, medical expert. Uh, this is Doctor Walid, who is an anaesthetist, and uh, he's um, going to be speaking about a few uh, uh, other issues that have uh, been raised by the community in regards to this report. So, Doctor Walid, Zakla Khairan, for joining me. May I just get started, inshallah, immediately with the very first question? Um, so, the uh, twenty-nine birds were presented in this report. Uh, there are claims that twenty-nine birds are not enough. What's your what's your thoughts? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh khair brother. Um before you before I answer your question, if you just give me a couple of seconds. Uh, first of all, uh Sadri wa Sali Amri Wahli I hope my answers is just going to be just an expert um, in the, in this setting um and i coming here uh, because the report and as the sheikh covered nicely that it uh, the whole matter is affecting the whole community and uh, thank you dr ihab for jazakallah khair for all what you've done for covering this study from your expertise and uh, uh, uh the thing that I'm coming to comment further is because anesthetists are the ones um, concerned um, with any living animal or creature when you give them gases and affecting their brains and heart. Uh, we are the ones who keep you all alive if you go into surgery and keep any creature alive when they go into surgery or uh, give, getting anesthetics. Um, so this is my expertise, this is my field, but um, as the Sheikh Shadi Jazawla Khair had said and said, if there will be any other scientific evidence that other people may hold or we might have not come across, this is the time to come and we will join. And if the Sheikh will call 
or ANIC or any other organization will call for any other another scientific meeting where um, vets, anesthetists, intensive care specialists, cardiologists, all the, um, and mashallah, in our community, we have a wealth of expertise and specialists all uh, in all specialties, basically. They come across, they might enrich this discussion if we have missed any. Now, back to your question. Uh, when the sample size is 29, 29 uh, in different specialties in medicine and vet is, uh, can be uh, uh, interpreted in different ways. When you're testing for, say, a new drug or a new uh, treatment, uh, whether uh, an instrument that you're going to be using or, uh, or a way of treatment uh, surgically or medically, um, that dictate the sample size, uh, how much you'd need, and the, obviously the prevalence of the disease uh, or uh, why we're doing this procedure. In this case, um, we are dealing with um, presumably a healthy sample of living uh, subjects, whether they're human or animal, and we go taking them through an experiment where we're introducing um, uh, through their body uh, a gas or uh, any uh, intervention, and we want to measure the outcome on life and death. It's not cure and no cure or side effects like a, a bleeding, uh, um, itchiness, or coughing, or anything. So we have healthy. Uh, subjects going through uh, an intervention where we introducing to their body a foreign um, um, material or gas, and the the outcome is measured into life and death. And when they all die, that twenty nine is far more than enough uh, in this case because um, the the it's irreversible outcome. And uh, you don't want to repeat it again. And hence, I want to say something is, again, um, I didn't come across many of this testing has been done, although this technique is being studied widely on different animals since the 1950s. And it gathered momentum to be used in the commercial world uh, from the 80s because um, the non-Muslim, obviously, they had their um, uh, reasons for doing it, and we might be covering it later. But there's not many studies that wanted to differentiate between the death and the live bird going through the inhalation of carbon dioxide at these protocols with high concentration mixed with another uh, agent, whether nitrogen or argon or um, just air, because that intervention, although they said it's anesthesia, but it's actually depriving the living subject from oxygen, which is the essential part of it, where the loss of consciousness to start with and the brain will start to deteriorate in its function and the cells die because the lack of oxygen, the carbon dioxide adds to it. And this is my field of things. These effects from the oxygen, lack of oxygen, and the add of, of carbon dioxide will kill the brain and will definitely stop the heart because there's no oxygen and high carbon dioxide will do this effect after this uh, duration that's set by these protocols. And these protocols are universal in all these facilities because they're set by the standards in this industry. And uh, hence, we are here today. And we invite me and Dr. Ihab and the Sheikh, as he's done in the first things, any other ex expertise, we can have another uh, discussion, not scientific, but the results will be not, uh, not different. I will allude to another st two studies is being done and in the 1990 where there's 320 uh, birds being uh, being used or going through the, the the same process and I can read the the results for you quite alarming is that there's like 300 
and 20 birds uh, or chicken uh, were, were stunned for two minutes in batches of uh, 10 uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the crate, um, 10 chicken in the crate, and four treatments. So they had 45%, they had 55% uh, of uh, dark, uh, carbon dioxide with 2% uh, oxygen or 5% oxygen respectively and the survival were, um, were recorded and it was 1% uh, uh, survived at the 45% uh, which is the same study that we have and at 45 oh, they were only uh, 20% so, uh, so 2 chicken out of 10 uh, survived and these survivals are uh, linked to these uh, studies. Hence, they, they don't find many studies of that. The same group tried to repeat it with argon, and the death happened completely 100%, whatever uh, the concentration of the carbon dioxide. Um, using why the standards using this concentration for carbon dioxide? Because they want to ensure that the first bird out and the last bird out in a, a slaughtered, they were all unresponsive. And as Dr. Ihab eloquently had put together, um, these reflexes or signs of life did not uh, show on these birds. And that's exactly what the standards want. They want the bird to be stunned, unresponsive. The word stunned is short of saying they are dead because it's. Um, it's a commercial word or wording. And, uh, and as we found in this uh, study or other studies, is this what it is? Uh, what's the outcome of exposing these birds to this concentration for that duration? Changing it will result in, if you reduce the, um, in that study, the, 30, the 324 birds that have been studied, when they put it as 10% um, uh, uh, carbon dioxide. Um, the birds, they all, uh, they all were awake. And uh, uh, once you get the crate out of the machine, and by the time that you come to unpack it and get them, they were awake. Twenty percent, the same thing. Thirty percent, they, um, the same thing. And forty percent is the same thing uh, in two minutes. But when they came, forty percent or forty-five after five minutes, then no signs of life. The standards set by animal welfare here in Australia by the Department of Agriculture. Um, so we did our testing in one site, in one facility. Um, uh, we are open to doing it in, in, in other facilities. However, we have uh, no access to other facilities and also a lot of reluctance for other facilities to give us access. Uh, so from that, we extrapolate that the standards are set by the government. It's not, um, it's not like a, 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 you know, a private company can change that. So can companies then reduce the amount of gas to perhaps, you know, uh, uh, alter the outcome? You can't, can't because, because they set it, set it for a reason. reason. Um, because the, the thing is that um, uh, this method, where if you go through the research from 1950 until where we are now, 2023, this method was designed for when they first tested it was on pigs uh, it was designed for pigs because there were reasons for it and then they moved on and in the 80s they tried to do it on the poultry and this is how the industry moved on all these years you cannot change it because as i said the, you want to ensure they want to ensure that these birds are unresponsive when they come from uh, from the chamber and will stay unresponsive while the workers try to cut their throats and bleed them. And, and to achieve that, this is the mixture, and that's the percentage and the duration that the computer has done for them. And when you use this standard, if you reduce it, they will be awake, and the, the whole thing will defeat uh, the purpose that they are after in their standards. And their standards, they're not in mind for the muslim community you have the the community has to understand when the animal welfare 
and the um, the industry agricultural industry they put these standards or these guidelines for a reason because they didn't want the birds to react and whether they are dead and not reacting or stand between brackets which is not um, and uh, and unreacting this is the, exactly what they're after and um, and uh, and uh, and scientifically from any living creature expose them to this concentration of course they're not going to be reacting because they did reducing it you need to reduce it to 10 percent co2 which means if just to allude you to the normal air that we are breathing the the co2 concentration is 0.4 percent so you're increasing it now to almost um uh, almost 300, uh, almost 300 percent, and that increase in CO2 will displace some oxygen, because where are the others uh, going to go, the other gases. So it reduces the oxygen, and the oxygen normally is 21 percent. Everybody knows that. That will be reduced to probably uh, eight, uh, 18 percent, but still uh, in a, li a, a livable percentage. Less than that, the the living subject will be suffering from what we call it low oxygen hypoxia and the brain will start to suffer and die and when the brain Dr. Walid, dies, Jazakallah khairan, Dr. Walid. Um, so just uh, finally inshallah we're going to end with this in your expert opinion after seeing the report uh, uh, what's your conclusion in in regard to the state of the poultry that came out after stunning um, as Dr. Ihab was saying, and uh, and uh, and the vets, and uh, if you show me that report, you tell me these birds were exposed to this percentage of carbon dioxide for this length, and these are the reflexes and the um, clinical signs or the or the signs of life uh, absent, and this ECG. By the way, ECG is not uh, we don't use it as a, a normal confirmation in, uh, for life and as dr Ihab in his report was uh, clearly said that and i can tell you that um, i've got another study that they've done in america last year dr walid i'm very mindful of time um so, oh, are, uh, uh, so they so they are dead basically there's no other way there's it cannot be alive Zakallah khairan dr walid for your expertise and your time uh, brothers and sisters, there you have it. You've heard it from the medical experts, uh, Dr. Yahab and Dr. Walid, who have both uh, given their uh, expert opinion on this report. Now, inshallah, I'm going to uh, uh, move my attention to uh, Naji, uh, who has been uh, at the forefront of this specific study. So, I'm, inshallah, I'm going to be uh, asking a number of questions uh, in regards to uh, this specific study that have also come from the community. So, we'll get started, inshallah, with the very first thing. Well, how was this scope set? So you can go ahead and uh, get started with this specific research. First, assalamualaikum to our viewers and uh, esteemed mashayikh and also our uh, specialists in, in, in their fields. Thank you for joining us. Um, SubhanAllah, the, the study, the way the study happened is we were tasked after the one path report came out, we were tasked with putting a scope together that would identify the methods that are required to test in this specific um, uh, type of stunning to determine what kind of results we, we achieve um, and to basically give that information back to the professionals to digest and then present that to the Fatwa Council to make a decision on from an Islamic perspective whether it fits within the halal standards or not. We, we are aware in terms of halal standards around the world that they don't approve of cast stunning um, from my understanding, no standard around the world and no company approves of um, cast stunning, except here in Australia. I've spoken to a numerous amount of uh, halal certification companies, which some of them have already stated in the one part video and in a statement as well, that they don't approve of cast stunning because the, the standard is they don't approve of cast stunning. On top of that, they believe the animal is dead and it's haram to um, certify in Islam. The way we formulated the scope in, in general, um, we, initially, uh, we initially did a bit of research into research papers. Um, we spoke to people in the field, for example, uh, prof professional people within the field, and to vets. 
Um, other than the vets that we engaged, we engaged other vets as well to get a bit more um, detailed information. And what we realized quite, quite quickly that originally we were looking at, at ECG readings. Then we determined that the vital signs is even more important than the ECG readings. So we started to put together a scope of, of vital signs that were required through the research, through looking at, at uh, reports online in terms of um, government regulations and how to be able to assume or, sorry, identify a deaf in, a, in, a, in, a, in an animal. Um, and that's how we put our scope together. So what we did, we put the scope, we went and sat with the vets, showed them the scope, went through the scope, refined it. Um, we, we wanted to not leave any parameters out. So as you can see, as the, um, I'm sure a lot of the doctors um, have explained, and they took a lot of my, uh, basically, uh, information that I was going to speak about, they spoke about it already, um, so I won't double touch on it. Um, but uh, the vital signs were one of the most important parts of that report. So because of that, the scope itself was very comprehensive. It allowed us to do enough work and enough research at the premises to get the results that we needed to get or information we needed to um, compile to be able to put it to the doctors to have a look over, give us their opinion, present it to the Fatwa Council for the Fatwa Council to make the opinion. I, I'm not a sheikh. Um, I, I don't profess to be anywhere close or have that knowledge. So we were asked to present a specific scope that meets the criteria. We presented the scope with the criteria. We tested the facility. And thank you very much for that facility for allowing us actually access. They were very helpful um, throughout the whole process. Even when the vet was there, their own vet was with us at the time and witnessed that the whole facility and the whole process of testing. We took that scope. We gave it to the Imams Council. The Imams Council, Fatwa Council, looked over it and then made the decision in relation to the report. Um, and you, as, you, as you see in front of you today. Right. So I just wanted to um, take a quick side note. Um, so the scholars, they say that the original ruling in regards to what is consumed <coughs> is that it's impermissible. <laughs> so it is impermissible to eat something that is slaughtered unless it is proven that it is halal. So currently at this stage, the report says that this uh, uh, type of uh, stunning uh, kills the animal before slaughter. Therefore, it becomes meta. Therefore, it is, uh, uh, is not considered uh, permissible to eat. Now, there's a lot of confusion in regards to different types of stunning. This report is making reference to one type of stunning, controlled atmospheric stunning, or what we also call killing now. And therefore, I'd like to ask Naji, what's the difference between water bath stunning and controlled atmospheric stunning? And is there any difference and is one permissible and the other not or are they both impermissible? What's the situation here? So as far as in, in terms of halal standards, the, 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 best, the best approach is non-stunning. Uh, Islamically, uh, from, my, from my understanding from the Mashaykh and from the uh, halal guidelines, non-stunned um, animals are, are of the highest uh, caliber in terms of slaughter because we know the animal is alive. It's present in front of you. Um, the animal is alive, you slaughter, the animal dies and you consume it. In terms of um, electric stunning and cast stunning, so the, basically the difference is between electric and cast. The reason, they're, they're the ones that are currently widely used in Australia. In terms of cast stunning itself, there is benefits to cast stunning over electric stunning in terms of the overall performance. When I say performance is, you're probably going to get less breakage in wings, less damage to the meat because the bird's not moving around the flapping when it's shackled. Um, and Sometimes they say it's a bit better quality as well um, of the product itself. But do we look at that in terms of Islamically to determine whether the animal is halal or not? As the Mashaykh said, no, we don't. Electric water bath stunning, the differences between the two in terms of process. What we need to understand uh, here is that although it doesn't matter in relation to what the outcome is out of the gas chamber, there's also a process after the gas chamber between how long it takes from the gas chamber to the hanging of the bird, from hanging the bird, how long it takes to reach the, the knife. In the facility we were at, it took roughly between, I think best case scenario was five to six minutes. Worst case scenario on the day was about 13, 12 to 13 minutes before the bird hit the blade. So you've got the five or so, five to six minutes in the chamber, and then you've got another anywhere from five, six minutes to 13 minutes. Um, and their process there, according to the vets that were there, and what they've seen in facilities, it is, was very good. Um, the process was, was quite efficient um, in terms of the way the cages came out um, one after the other. So the birds were actually hung in order of what they came out from that, from that specific um, uh, chambers. 
There is a process where birds will get dumped onto a line and then they hang them. So, so let's go back to the, the, the question. Yes. Electric stunning and gas stunning, okay. the difference. So the benefit islamically of the electric stunning, it allows us a, a little bit more efficiency in terms of the neck cut, the speed of neck cut. So initially what happens is when the bird comes through, um, it comes through alive. The, the employees will take the bird and will shackle the bird on shackles. And then as soon as they shackle the birds on shackles, they go down the line and they go for an electric stunner. Electric water bath stunner, it consists of like a tub, or, or, or like a sink, um, and it's got uh, like a water which is electrified, and the heads dip in, they come out. As they come out, within like not far away from it, 10, 20, 30 seconds, um, it goes either through the machine and gets slaughtered, or there's a, there's a person at the end, if it's hand slaughtered, and they'll slaughter the neck of the animal, straight after. So it's a very, very quick process. So is stunning a, a, a mandatory uh, practice here in Australia? So in Australia, um, it, it's, it's part of the, the policy and procedures of the, uh, in law that stunning is required. There is a couple of um, obviously plants that um, are allowed to non-stun for specific purposes. Um, but that dates back at quite, a, quite a long time um, and they're still maintaining that, um, that capability at the moment. Um, in terms, like I said, in terms of electric stunning, what it allows the, the people to see or allows the employee to see, when they hang the animal, if the animal is dead, it's very visible. Because if it's not dead, it's alive in front of you. If they see an animal not moving, the animal's dead, they remove it off the line and discard of it. So every animal that goes through on a chain can be visibly identified whether alive or dead. It goes through the stunner, comes out, instantly gets cut, either by hand or through the blade. So uh, there's, no, there's no delay there. There's, no, there's hardly so, any so, delay. So the, 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 the overall, I mean, the conclusion at the end. Mm. Um, we said we've already established CAS uh, is not uh, halal permissible, it's not considered halal. Yes. Right. What about what about stunning? So in, in accordance to most uh, to, to some of the, most of the standards, um, because of the stunning requirements here in Australia, there has been fatwas in relation to electric water bath stunning to, for its permissibility. Uh, and even countries overseas. Um, are uh, they alive when they go through the... Yes, they're, they're definitely alive, yes. And they are reversible too? Uh, electric stunning is usually a reversible system. Um, mm -hmm. So if you take the animal off, put it aside, it'll come back to life. What uh, about the CAS? With CAS, it's in, it's, it's not a, there's no ability to, for it to come uh, back to life. And from my understanding, like in my research, that it's agreed upon in the, in the industry that there is no way a bird that will go through a gas chamber will be reversible. Of course, the, the reason being for that, because like I said, the time, wide, the time frame. Mm. With electric stunning, it gets stunned and instantly into the mm. cut. Where with the uh, gas stunning, there, sometimes there's five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. So the, the, by the time the animal gets hung and goes through the, uh, the, the slaughter process. So in that time, if it's not enough, if the animal re, uh, can come back to life in that 15 or 20 minutes or six minutes even, there's a, there's a high chance that the animal, um, they have to put it back through the stunner again. The whole purpose of, of cast stunning is so the animal doesn't move when it's hung, mm. less breakage, less damage to the animal itself. Mm. Um, and that's obviously mm. evident in- I came in across reason. a research, uh, the original name of uh, cast stunning, yeah, what was it called? It's a uh, controlled atmosphere killing. Yes, the, and uh, that's in the government document. And it's still yes. currently in Australian standards. That's yeah. what's actually written. It's uh, written as controlled atmospheric uh, killing. And this mm. is uh, by the Department of Agri uh, the Department of Agriculture in the standards in regards to how a uh, birds are, are killed in specific poultry. So, mm. um, so let's actually speak a bit more about practical steps, mm. right? So let's speak about what it means on the ground for the Muslim community. What are they supposed to be doing right now that they've actually heard this? Now, there's been a lot of talk. Why did ANIC not release, um, you know, a list of places where we can go to so we can get, you know, halal poultry? And the, the reason being, I mean, to, to, to put it simply, is that it's a lot more complicated than just coming out with a simple list. Right, mm. and the reason behind that is there's a lot of logistical issues. So let's let's talk a bit more about that and and why that's uh, there's a lot of complicated issues associated with this. That's a difficult one. Um, it's a very hard one to explain uh, in in such a short time frame, but I'll try my best, inshallah. The issue is with the supply chain is in Australia. Obviously, there's abattoirs who are electric stun and cast stun. Some brands own both types of stunning methods, cast and electric. So they determine exactly where that, that chicken is coming from, which facility is coming from, is very, very difficult unless it comes directly from that facility. Unfortunately for our, our shops and so forth, it, it's, it's very difficult for them because they're, they're unable to buy from these specific facilities directly. 
they're not big enough to buy from these facilities directly. So usually there's an intermediary, which is the wholesaler. The wholesaler usually would buy from this facility, this facility, this facility, and then sell to the to the to the people, to the butchers, to the shops, to the cafes, to so forth. And this is where the the breakdown in in in, in the line in the chain happens. So. Unless you're buying directly from a factory, um, uh, it's, it becomes very, very difficult to identify. In terms of what measures we can put in place to, 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 for that to happen, the easiest way to fix the solution, the big, quickest solution in the meantime, is decertifying of cash facilities. What that allows, it allows those specific brands then to say, okay, whatever I have that um, is coming out of my uh, water bath stump facility is labelled now halal. So no cash stump facility chicken gets labelled halal. And everything that comes out, we know then is halal accordance with cast, oh, sorry, uh, electric water bath stump facilities. So it won't get mixed. So it won't get mixed because, well, then it comes down to the certification company who, who certifies the wholesaler to make sure that the, the wholesaler is not mixing between those products, such as checking the inventory that comes in, um, their, their, their stock records and so forth, and doing a proper efficient yeah. audit. So, um, so what's, what's your advice right now to uh, you know, the average Muslim and also business owners in regards to seeking um, you know, uh, halal uh, poultry? For, for a consumer, um, like I said, it's, it is difficult. It's, it's quite difficult. In, in terms of, a, of a, a shop or a cafe or so forth, I encourage them to try to find facilities that they're capable of supplying them, whether it be uh, facilities that we've recommended online, um, uh, other facilities. Ask the questions, ask the right questions. We, as a community, so what we need to realize is there's a strong push, there's a strong push to, especially from animal welfare and so forth, to push the cast on method. Strong push. If we as a Muslim community don't get on top of this today, in the future, the majority of facilities will end up using cast um, And this is going to be a disaster for us as Muslims if we can't fix the have a solution for it today. Mm -hmm. uh, sure, obviously, yeah. that's one of the areas that we've been uh, considering and we've been talking to the authorities and different departments to try and put pressure. But obviously, we need the community's help. When we put pressure and when there's a consumer's pressure, on the, uh, on the suppliers, on the facilities, that will also help our cause. So we've taken this on board, but I also want to make it very clear to our brothers and sisters, I think we need to start managing expectation. So we as ANIC will do our best, but it doesn't mean I have authority over those facilities or I have an authority over a, a restaurant or over a butcher where they get them, uh, you know, their meat from. We do our best. We are trying to do our best. And, you know, it reminds me of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi when he had two people disputing, said, I'll make a judgment according to my best of, my ability and what I hear. So the, uh, it's important that we send this message across to manage expectation that we as ANIC, we are committed in serving the community. We are committed in trying to resolve this difficult situation that we're in. And uh, we don't want to see the community being in that, but we had no other option except to do that. And uh, we want to find more solutions. But there are things not in our hands. And a lot of the times people expect that you could get, just get into a, sh uh, into a shopping center, or into a restaurant, or into a butcher, and you could just inspect it. We can't do that. Even when we do inspect, we we'll probably go to some restaurant and they, you see everything, everything ticks the box. You walk out of the door, he does something different. I, I'm not there 24-7 and I don't have access 24-7. But people need to be honest from both ends. You know, the retailer and the seller needs to be honest and the consumer needs to put pressure on them. So Alhamdulillah, we are committed in doing that. We're trying to come up with solutions. And again, I'm very sorry to see what's happening in the community. That's why we've been trying to explore many different options and solutions. But we had no other choice except to release this statement and this report because it's the right of the community for them to know what's happening. Along the way, inshallah, we'll continue working on solutions. Along the way, inshallah, we'll continue to look into different uh, uh, research. Along the way, we'll continue to look into different reports. And alhamdulillah, the Fatwa Council and the ANIC executive, we're very open. We're not like... We are set, that's because of, you know, standing or anything. We just want to see the scientific facts. We want to see the experts report. If it says it's alive, it's alive. If it's dead, it's dead. And inshallah, we want to continue doing with that. And uh, yes, a lot of people love their poetry. I understand that. I love my chicken too. And I'm sure a lot of people love to eat their chicken burgers. I love to eat their poetry and so on. But is that a necessary of life? No, it isn't a necessary of life. So it's unfortunately, we probably need to reduce a bit of that and be very vigilant on those facilities that, you know, don't use cast stunning, they only use water bath stunning or any other type of stunning. Some of them probably don't even do any stunning. And uh, I know it's a bit of a, too much of an ask of people to continue asking, 
But unfortunately, this is the situation that we're in right now. Sheikh, some people might turn around and say, look, this is in a too hard basket. There's no hope. What's, I, uh, what's, what's your, no, what's there's, your a, there's a lot of hope, alhamdulillah. And alhamdulillah starts from this report. That's why we initiated it. And alhamdulillah, you've got a reputable organization of 250 imams. This is not a one-man uh, show or two men. Or We had a meeting with the an executive committee. We had a meeting with the Fatwa Council, with the 200 imams. And we've been very transparent. We've been very open. That's one of the reasons we've delayed the report. This is a 14 months old report. Like to me, deep inside, I, I sense people are upset. Why didn't you issue that report a few months after it? But we went in that position. We were trying to explore those options to be as transparent, as consulting as uh, possible. So is there hope? 100% there is a hope. And Alhamdulillah starts from tonight. It starts from now. But we just have to all strive towards that hope. We all need to work towards that. Not pointing the blame at anyone. And we need to be constructive. We need to be strategic. And we need to be smart. And Alhamdulillah, this is a journey. And inshallah will overcome it, ibn ta'ala. The Muslim community overcame bigger challenges than the poetry. And Alhamdulillah, look where we are right now. Inshallah, this is another challenge. Okay? It's a bit of an inconvenient one. But inshallah, will overcome it too. Sheikh, can I get one minute? Uh, Sheikh, Jazallah khair, mashallah alayk, Sheikh, you are fantastic. Can I add one more thing? Is that, uh, or a few things actually. The first one is that uh, there are facilities that they don't do stunning and they had an exclusion there. And by law, and we're trying to do this anti discrimination religious anti-discrimination and this is one of them and that's how the Jews uh, got their uh, facilities and they don't do stunning and as the Sheikh was saying that as a consumers and as Muslims if we get united whether behind the ANIC because of this fatwa which is quite solid on the clinical basis and the scientific basis but as the Sheikh had called for anybody to come forward if they have a scientific evidence that is not that the sheikh is doing everything to unite the whole community For, as a muslim as a person i'm not a sheikh and as the brothers there i'm calling for all the certifying establishments here in australia whether they establish they would they certify um the gas or they certify the uh, just the slaughters without stunning or with stunning they put back into the community because their certification is with a fee. This fee is the community, the wider community, the Muslim communities pays for it. These fees are theirs. They need to put back the, that fees, part of it, into the community interest, which, first of all, get the hand with the sheikh and go and knock on the door for the government to get our slaughterhouse and build facilities in Queensland and Victoria and, and we have we have a, we have a consumer power to build these facilities out of this um, certification that we've been doing for years and years and years let's put them back into the community let's build slaughterhouse and get exemptions from all standing as the brothers and as the sheikh has said we don't want to get into the discussion if we they have no slaughter uh, no standing Let's get behind the sheikh, behind the anik, behind this power, behind this, uh, and do the halal. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he promised us, if we follow this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, imagine how quickly we will be uh, coming out of this victorious. This is my call for everybody who is in this industry and the mashayikh to get together, to get this act and and do it. We, as the Sheikh was there saying, we've done very much worse than this. Jazakallah khairan, Dr. Walid. So final remarks, inshallah, with Naji. So I'd just like to uh, obviously uh, address a few little little subjects. Um, firstly, the, the thing about, okay, why um, any, benef any halal benefits from, from um, such a thing or it's a financial gain. The, this argument kills me, subhanAllah, because how do we achieve financial gain from something that we can't certify? This actually creates a drama for certification companies because when you have a product that's not halal, it hinders our ability to certify wholesalers, to certify specific restaurants, to specific, um, specific um, suppliers. It hinders a lot in terms of what our business is capable of certifying. 
when I found out in relation to this issue originally after the one part video, my kids, like most of the Muslim kids, they all eat nuggets. I opened my freezer, I took all the nuggets and I threw them in a bin. And that was ups upsetting itself. In terms, in terms of uh, the rhetoric that we talk about, uh, and I, I saw a video on, on, uh, on somewhere someone shared it with me, Mr. TikTok, I call him, but um, in, in terms of Anik only says that whatever their chickens they certify is halal and that's it. As soon as I heard that comment, I instantly shut the, shut the video off. Reason being because I can't entertain people like that. Reason, like, we've recommended different brands on our website to say well, these are the brands that you can use. Two out of those eight so far are certified by Anik and the rest of them are not. Um, like, this is the, don't feed into this kind of narrative, you know. Everybody, us as certifiers, in the certifiers out there, we have a responsibility, Islamic responsibility. If you know something is not halal, to speak about it, to divulge it, to, to discuss it, f figure out ways that we can fix it. We don't have this issue in, in an export on an export basis because the Australian government regulates the export basis, the export um, product that goes out. Domestically, we have issues, major issues. People claiming, restaurants claiming that they're halal when they're cooking pig, bacon and cooking halal stuff on the same hot plates, you know, and, and advertising certificates. Where's our, where's our push against this? We've engaged with the ACCC, we've asked the questions, what can we do about it? Mm. You know, this is what the certification bodies and everyone as a community needs to put, put their hands together to try to work on that. There needs to be some kind of you know, a, 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 a regulated basis here in, in Australia for us to consume halal, for, for us to monitor our halal, to us to improve our halal status here whether it's pressure from overseas here to make sure that um, you know, there's a regulation, whether uh, halal bodies come together and, and really discuss this, or people within the industry come forward and really discuss this, you know, try to work together to make sure we maintain the integrity of halal in Australia before it's too late, because it's only going to get worse as we expand as a community. Okay, Sheikh, final remarks? No, inshallah, inshallah, it's only going to get better as we expand as a community and as we continue working together, inshallah. And that's one of the primary objectives of the Australian National Imams Council is to bring the imams together and to bring the Muslim community together and to lead the community to what's best for them as Muslims, as Australian Muslims living in this country. Yes, we do have challenges. Yes, we don't always agree on everything. But alhamdulillah, the, the, the Australian Muslim community should be very happy that you have such an organization like ANIC that brings 250 Imams and our Imams are very unique Imams like you know with the diversity of the Imams and their background Alhamdulillah they're very open-minded, they work together even during times of differences and disagreements and Alhamdulillah they're very open towards you know practicality and what's pragmatic and what's reality and moving forward and we're not stuck in ways we just want to see what's in the best interest of the Muslim community do we get it always right? no sometimes we might get, get it wrong but Alhamdulillah, we are trying. Alhamdulillah, we're trying. When we get it right, we move forward. When we get it wrong, we correct and continue moving forward. And inshallah, this is, you know, as I mentioned, this is one of the challenges that the Muslim community is encountering. And I don't see it to be one of the biggest challenges. We've experienced bigger challenges than this. But Alhamdulillah, we stood strong. And inshallah, bi ta'ala, I'm confident that we'll continue to stay strong and overcome this, inshallah. And we'll continue, inshallah, growing and moving forward as a community, bi ta'ala. Sorry, may I say one more thing, Sheikh, just uh, quickly. Look, we, I invite any facility, uh, cast on facility, or even the certification bodies that uh, have access, open up your doors. Let's, let's, let's do, the, let's do the, the testing in line with the scope that we've done on this facility. Those, the scope is very, very intense and very comprehensive. Use the scope. We're happy to supply it to you, to come with you, work with you. Let's work on trying to fix the issues. This is something that we should be able to do together. Well, I'm happy. You, you can also contact us and Inshallah. any, any facility that's open to do yeah, so. Yeah, I'm committed to that. I'll also invite if there are any reports out there, yes. experts reports, whether in line or challenging the existing reports that we have before us, even if they are challenging the global reports, we're happy to look into them. We've been looking for that for the last year. So if anyone has an expert report, a verified report, not someone told me and I heard. No, no, no. We need an expert report that's going to be in the public too. This is something that the community has the rights to know. Like our report became public. If anyone is willing to give us their report, even if it counters our report, with all means, we're happy to look into it. We're happy to study it. We're happy to, inshallah, explore this option. And uh, inshallah, hoping that inshallah, we'll just establish our opinion on scientific facts and experts' opinion. Jazakum Allah khairan, Sheikh Shadi, Brother Naji, 
uh, Dr. Walid, Dr. Ihab, our great panelists who got together today so we can explain the matter to every single one of our viewers today. Brothers and sisters, the report that was presented by the Australian National Imams Council is in line with global standards around the world that do not accept caste stunning or killing. Therefore, it is impermissible to eat from any facility that uses caste stunning. We invite all other caste facilities to open their doors, inshallah, for us to continue to do some testing. I we invite anyone who has any counter reports to present it to the Australian National Imams Council. Whilst, this, whilst we understand this causes grief to many of us because of the disruption in the supply chain, know that by the little effort that you're going to do, inshallah, collectively as a Muslim community, we're all going to overcome this. The Prophet ﷺ, says, Seeking what is halal is, is compulsory upon every single Muslim. You are a Muslim. You believe in Allah. And you want to eat only what is halal. We have presented this report to every single one of you for the well-being and the spiritual connection for every single one of you to stay within the realm of what is considered consuming halal. Brothers and sisters, Jazakumullah khairan for joining us today. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to overcome these challenges and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us the strength. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless us and will bless every single one of you as you're all going to give that effort bi idhnillahi ta'ala. Jazakumullah khairan for joining. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam